We're in the village of Chachkardi, and we're gonna go see a very, very old vine. <laughs> this is not a tree. So earlier today we saw uh, one-year-old vines, yeah. which were about that big, <laughs> yeah. and uh, four hundred-year-old vines, the the oldest probably in the world, huh? Yeah, it's the oldest uh, in the world, uh, which is still gives us a grip, and it is still alive. It is four centuries old. This is the most amazing thing I've ever yeah. seen in my life. This is unbelievable. As a devout wine lover who's dedicated my life to its pursuit, it was essential that I visit the Republic of Georgia, long regarded as the birthplace of wine. As I know and everyone knows that Georgia has 8,000 years of winemaking tradition. In Georgia, people know that uh, Mescheti and this part is the best place of Georgian wine. This is Georgi Natanzahe, a preservationist and leading protagonist for the country's resurgent wine industry, fueled largely by an emerging global marketplace for so-called natural wines. In southern Georgia, near the Turkish border, Georgi invites us into one of his many cellars to taste his latest creations. Okay. I have different wine cellars. <laughs> yeah, many different cellars. Yeah, because I have many different experiments yes. every year, so I have not enough space for it. Let's go taste this one. It is from uh, uh, last year. Okay. It was for six months in, a qu in queries, okay. different queries. Query. To know Georgian wine, you must first know the quevery an ancient egg-shaped clay vessel that's buried underground and used to preserve and mature wines. In fact, it was the grape skin particles found at the bottom of a quevery that have given archeologists and Georgians the confidence that their claims to being the world's original home of wine are justified. And let's taste this one, okay? okay. I took it for, uh, with its skin from quevery, okay? Because I want it, I think that with more skin, it's better. It's more amber, and every week when I'm tasting, the, it became more uh, tasty, and I find different new aromas mm -hmm. from forest and from mountains and from villages, wow. and no one cares about these grapes. <laughs> <laughs> Except for you. Yeah. You see the skin? Mm -hmm. So those are the skins and the seeds too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look the color. This extraordinary amber color in just the last few years, has grown from obscurity to coveted. Wines made in this fashion are the result of extended contact with the grape skins and seeds, a stylistic affront to the French sensibilities of fine wine, but an absolute delight for a new generation of wine drinkers. Cheers. Cheers, Carmajos. Insurgent, Carmajos. Carmajos. <laughs> Without human intervention, this honey yellow hue is indeed the color of wine. Georgie's impact on the world of wine transcends these modest cellars. He's created a monumental restoration project, replanting thousands of wild vines on terraced vineyards. These grapes were once thought to be extinct, but this endeavor ensures that that will never happen again. So how many years until you think you'll start to bear fruit from these vines? This year will be the first year of our uh, vintage, mm -hmm. after fourth century. Mm -hmm. So the history is alive now. <laughs> Again, there is 400 years between the last time these grapes were consumed or, or grown or even harvested by anyone else. So we will see a real renaissance of the indigenous wines of this region, indigenous grapes of this region. Back at Natanzahe Cellars, I learned Georgia's reputation for hospitality is well earned. Traditional dishes like pickled beets, kachapuri, and the soft mountain cheeses, sulguni and imaruli, fill the table. It's, it's um, beef. This? Beef, okay, cool. Yeah. Of course, Jordi's wines did too. 
all of which were new to my palate, a delightful rarity after many years of professional tasting. Mm. Super fresh. To drink Georgie's wines is to accept an invitation into his village, his family, and his traditions. Maloa. American, I think it's over here. Vine by vine, Georgie brings us back to a world thought to be lost forever. Oh my God, man. I never tasted anything like this. <laughs> and not just one we read about, but one we can touch, smell, and taste. The Republic of Georgia is a deeply religious country. More than 80% of its residents are Orthodox Christian. At the foot of the Caucasus Mountains is a beautiful valley that, over the last two decades, is more widely known as a breeding ground for a radical Islam than customary Georgian hospitality. It is home of the Kist, a Muslim subset with ethnic and cultural ties from neighboring Chechnya. It is here we meet a woman looking to change the reputation of her village. This is Layla Akishvili. In 2016, she opened Layla's Guest House, a serene bed and breakfast in the village of Jokolo. This is part of Georgia, but uh, we are ethnical minority from Chechnya. Kisti, we call Kisti. Over a breakfast of scrambled eggs and dumplings, Layla, with the help of our friend Tuarisa, shares her story, providing further context for the collective apprehension for our visit to the region. This radical Islam difficult to living with boys, with children, because the mentality changes very much. This is a very strong Islam we call Wahhabism. For the young people of Jokolo, there are very few economic opportunities. Disillusioned and aimless, many young men began to embrace a darker vision for their life's ambitions. So she don't want it again to see some bad stories. So she said to family, go from here in freedom in Europe, it's better. But in a cruel reversal of fortune, after sending her two sons abroad, they were radicalized in Europe and eventually fled to Syria where they died fighting for ISIS. We can't change something. We continue the living and we are in life. And we have guests and we are very happy to give food. So she's very positive. Layla's guest house is a rejection of that hatred. And with that, we head into town to collect local ingredients for lunch. We don't give uh, the chemical products. Everything is natural. Uh, very important here, cow and sheep. People don't eat here the pig uh, meat. Despite the strict adherence to Islamic traditions regarding alcohol, grapevines grow everywhere. It is part of the landscape, an organic part of the Georgian ecosystem. Modi, modi. And basically what we're doing here is uh, getting all of our dairy products for our lunch today. Um, and they have this high-tech little digital scale with a hook on it that they weigh out all the dairy products on. So uh, 1.5 kilos of butter. The going rate here is six US dollars for the tastiest butter of all time basically separating the whey from the top. It's sort of creamy. It's like sour cream, almost like a buttermilk, actually. It sort of looks like uh, yogurt and milk, a hybrid of the two. Mm. Wow. Super creamy, really, really sour. It's a little bit cooler than room temperature but incredible flavor actually tastes like a cow smells but I mean that in the best way possible after getting
gathering our dairy and freshly ground corn from a local mill, we headed back to the house for an unforgettable lunch. By any standard, Layla is an extraordinary cook. Bolstered by the freshness of local ingredients, this was a glorious introduction to Chechen cuisine. Braised lamb, boiled potatoes, hand-rolled noodles, Georgian cornbread, and mounds of fresh garden herbs. Yes, so this is the same corn flour that we saw from the mill. Basically, it's the universal delight of fried corn product. So whether you're talking about in Mexico or a plantation in the South, or in the cuts of the Republic of Georgia, everyone loves fried corn. In Quran, it's also like this. This is his story. If someone is coming and is hungry, you should to go give the food. You have something or you don't have something, you need to give what you have from heart. So this is blessing for Layla. This sanctuary isn't just a blessing for Layla. It's a gift to all of us lucky enough to experience it. Well, we came here to ask questions. You know, we came here obviously with a camera and hopefully a little bit of humility, uh, not trying too hard to force our own story on this culture. Um, part of our good fortune here has been that we've had really amazing hosts who are willing to share their story and willing to let us inside of their day-to-day -day lives. Easter Sunday, a day for family, remembrance, and of course, copious amounts of wine. In our glass is Cozzatelli, an ever-present table wine. It's low in alcohol, often transported in plastic bottles and consumed throughout the day. In Georgia, food is central to the Easter holiday. They make pasca, a golden bread ornately shaped with a buttery lacquer reminiscent of hala. On the table, an array of meats and sweets, and of course, Easter eggs, stained red from the roots of the matter plant. This is for our nationality, for Georgian nationality. Mm. But in, in Georgia, this is so funny, this word. I but I'm Georgian too. Yes, yeah, let's go to Alibaba. Let's Georgia Danova. Cool. Georgia Danova. Cool. I'm Russian. I'm Russian. Cool. Okay, so it is the Monday after Easter, and we started off celebrating on Good Friday with lots of cooking. We continued eating through yesterday, and today I think is the conclusion of the holidays uh, by a visit to the cemetery, which will culminate in more eating and drinking. And uh, that's about as much as I know, and that might not even be right. We'll see. <laughs> After an Easter meal that takes days to prepare, the village convenes at the cemetery, surrounded by loved ones both present and lost, all of whom are ingrained in the traditions of this important holiday. The entire village is gathered here in the cemetery to remember their loved ones, and the mood is, I would say, uh, decidedly not somber, but uh, celebratory. There's people who are eating and drinking and who have brought uh, things to remember um, their loved ones by. There's people of all ages, and we're now going to have a picnic here in the cemetery. <laughs> The best moment. The best moment. George. As generations of families picnic around tombstones, this Westerner's preconceived notions about cemeteries are shattered completely. More wine is drunk, more jokes are told, and the entire village fills the streets in celebration. 
What I came to understand is that this day was not a day of remembrance, rather a revival of spirit. Wine is central to Georgian culture, and once again, I'm taken by the earnestness with which it permeates daily life without pretension. This ceremonial but informal inclusion affirms my own mission to demystify wine, to shed it of its formality, and in doing so, share the gift of a new tongue, a language that, once learned, deepens our capacity for pleasure and connects us to a collective human history. <laughs>